Great, so welcome everyone to From the Ground Up. And this session is Sea Libraries in Public Libraries, a panel discussion. And we're scheduled to go until about 12.30 p.m. today. We may end a little bit earlier, but we'll see, we do have that time. Um, and as mentioned, we are recording today. So please just turn your video off again if you're just joining us, um, if you'd like to not be uh, on the recording. And I'd just like to start us off um, by saying, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm the Thompson Caribou Region Coordinator, Seed Security Program Coordinator for Farm Folk, City Folk. And um, I would like to acknowledge the unceded and traditional territories that are from the many First Nations peoples whose land we all reside on across today, what is commonly known as British Columbia. Since time immemorial, First Nations people have cared for, honored and stewarded seeds and their stories of many of the seeds that sustain us, grow in our gardens, and wait in seed libraries to continue their stories. I would like to extend our gratitude and admiration to the many First Nations people for their ongoing dedication to stewarding and protecting these important seeds. And today we're joined by Walter and Melanie, and uh, Melanie is from the UBC Seed Library. Unfortunately, Jody from who was joining us originally joining us from Ontario uh, had to bow out last minute um, but we're very thankful that Melanie was able to jump in and she'll be sharing uh, the experience from the UBC State Library and so both panelists uh, will have about 20 to 30 minutes each just to uh, talk about how their seed libraries work and then we'll have a, lots of time for the Q&A uh, session at the end um, so I will hand it over to Walter first Hi folks, uh, I'm going to be sharing a slide or like a PowerPoint presentation. So just give me a quick second to get that all shared up here. Uh, anyways, my name is Walter Zika. I'm uh, the head of acquisitions and collection management at the North Vancouver City Library, which is uh, actually located in North Vancouver, which is on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, which includes the Squamish, Sabletooth, and Musqueam Nation. But currently, I am actually in Gibsons, which is uh, on the traditional territories of the Seashell Nation, and one of the most beautiful places in the whole wide world. Okay. Okay, uh, just give me a quick second to get actually all shared up here. I just want to just uh, press share a screen. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting a little message saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Sarah? If I make him co-host, David, does that work? Yeah, that might work, I think. Yeah. And let me just try this. I think you should be able to share now. I just uh, changed okay. the settings, okay. I believe. Okay. And then, uh, can you folks see that? You're good, Walter. Yep. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so uh, the presentation which I'm going to be providing today uh, is regarding, of course, seed libraries and public libraries. And it's, of course, a panel discussion. So we have lots of different people who are going to be speaking about a lot of different things today. Um, anyways, so I guess I'm going to just kind of get going on this because I know a lot of other people have a lot of other things that they would like to say. If I'm not speaking loud enough, let me know. Um, I have a bit of a hearing issue, so <laughs> so I understand that if that's the case. And if I'm speaking too fast, just say, Walter, slow it down. Okay, so um, I'm from the city of North Vancouver, and the city of North Vancouver is located on the just on the broad inlet uh, from downtown Vancouver. And it's on the North Shore, the beautiful North Shore. So we share the North Shore with the district of North Vancouver. Uh, there's the city of North Vancouver, and there's also beautiful West Vancouver. Uh, we're on uh, the unceded, uh, ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish and Sabletooth nations. So we're located at the foot of Gross Mountain, and we have access to lots of parks, forests, and nature preserves, uh, and a whole lot of bears. And believe it or not, yes, the bears do come out to play once in a while. And two weeks ago, I literally bumped into a bear myself. Uh, at about 6.30 in the morning, which was kind of unbeknownst to me this first time ever. Um, the current population is 59,500 just in the city of North Vancouver, and our median age is 41.2 years. Uh, there's a lot of seniors, a lot of younger folks. We have a very diverse demographic with a large Persian, Filipino, Korean, and Eastern European uh, population. Uh, the city is very active in terms of arts, sports, and commerce. Uh, we have the highest number, believe it or not, of home-based businesses in, of all communities in British Columbia. So lots of home-based businesses going on. 
And approximately 50% of our housing base uh, is apartment, condo, or multifamily dwellings. So space is very congested, it's very dense, and it's very limited. Therefore, there's a whole lot of balcony and uh, patio gardening, gardening going on. Our main issues in our city are affordability for housing, uh, issues uh, regarding transportation, and densification. So I'm just starting to create the context and working our way in here. So about North Vancouver City Library, this is the beautiful library which I work at, and it is a 3,000, sorry, 35,000 square foot facility. We're a single site library system, and we're the 10th lar largest system in British Columbia. We have officially functioned as a public library since about 1940. Uh, we currently, um, we're currently, as I said, housed in a 35,000 square foot facility, and our current print collection size is about 160,000 items, and that includes books, audiovisual materials, magazines, newspapers, so on and so forth. We have access to approximately 68,000 e-books and 26,000 e-audiobooks through a consortial collection, as well as through um, an overdrive advantage collection, which is unique and specific to our library. Our staff complement is approximately 55 full-time, part-time, and auxiliary staff, and we're open to the public for a total of about 70 hours a week. Um, and just for a little bit of extra trivia out here, if you look really, 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 really closely at the library, uh, we're used a lot for movie sets and filming. Uh, so if you remember the Arrow series or a lot of those Harlequin romance kind of um, things, which are shown on, uh, like, you know, on, I think it's on the Women's Network, as well as uh, the Geico Green Lizard commercials, you might recognize your library. So we have that little green gecko walking around everywhere. He's my little friend. <laughs> Okay, so starting our seed library. So let's get down to everything that we do. Besides having collections and programs and um, things available for teen, adult, children, so on and so forth, we have a lot of different programs and projects which we have on the go at the library. So uh, we first uh, heard about seed collections and seed libraries um, actually uh, several years ago. We were actually at a PNLA, which is Pacific Northwest Library Association Conference, and that was around 2013. And it sounded interesting as it would fit into our like OCP, which is our official um, community and city plan, uh, the mandate, which is uh, for creating green spaces, engaging community uh, sustainable practices and supporting local gardening and food safety initiatives. Um, in 2014, our library was contacted by a local not-for-profit not agency known as the Edible Garden Project. Uh, so we saw an opportunity because they were looking for ways to actually be able to distribute seeds to the public but they had no way of doing so. Whereas we were looking for setting up something with seeds that we could provide to the public, but we didn't really have seeds or know-how. So uh, what happened was we started working with the EGP, the Edible Garden Project. Um, and we worked around their mandate, which was, as I said, to mainly promote and share and provide uh, seeds to members in the community so they could start growing their own gardens. And we also wanted to provide um, an opportunity for the public to actually come in to start using different types of collections, especially ones that would actually be able to promote and develop community and community partnerships. So we did a lot of investigating into other seed collections and services at other local libraries, but we really didn't see anything that we thought would be greatly beneficial to our specific community. And that was at the beginning. So we decided to think big and uh, do it our way. Initially, we partnered with the Edible Garden Project to put together an easy to follow system for borrowing, planting and returning seeds. However, the seed collection has grown and developed and we now essentially have taken over the primary curatorship and maintenance of this collection for the benefit of our user community. And I think that some library folk out there will probably understand where you start something off, it's all working fine as a partnership and then eventually it ends up in your lap, which is kind of neat which is kind of neat because if it works, it works. And if you have it down to a really great system, perfect. Um, the EGP, uh, the Edible Garden Project, still does support our program through occasional donations of seeds. And um, when we started our program, officially, it was in 2015. That's when we launched it. And it's continued to develop in terms of popularity and usage. So we started small and started working our way up big for providing seeds to the public. Over the years, we've modified many of the procedures and responsibilities related to the seed library collection. And it was mainly just to streamline and simplify how it's maintained. And by early 2022, so by the beginning of this year, uh, we've been circulating an average of about 1,800 to 2,000 seed packets annually or seed envelopes annually. And memberships uh, for our uh, seed library club or, or the North Vancouver uh, City uh, Seed Library Club 
uh, has surpassed surprisingly 400 registrants. Like we thought we were going to be like a smaller program with about 75 folks ongoing or whatever, and it's growing and growing and growing and growing. So it's uh, been quite the success. Okay. So what we needed to get it going. So of course, when you start any kind of program or project in a library, you always have to start off with the basis. And the basis is the foundations or the kind of like guidelines or principles behind why you're going to be doing something. Um, now, I'm not sure what I could really define this as, but I mean, I know that we have uh, things such as, you know, social literacy, computer literacy, uh, reading literacy in libraries. And I would probably call this seed literacy and gardening literacy. <laughs> so our goals and objectives for the program, which is basically uh, we have to figure out what the why is, why we wanted to do this. We want to figure out the what, which was going to be what it was going to look like. Uh, we have to figure out where to house the seeds and make them available to the public. So that was going to be the where, where we're we going to put it out. And the processes, procedures, and how it will work. That was going to, of course, be the how. And if the seed library would be available year round or seasonally, so the when, and how we maintain the seed library and who does it. So the who is involved with it. Now, the reason why this was important to do was it was really going to help structure the program of how you want it to work. Uh, we had visited several other libraries before, and we found that a lot of libraries were actually using their seed, uh, their seed collections as kind of like cameo collections that would be brought out during special events or during outreach programs and things. And we wanted to actually have something that was going to be available ongoing um year round while we're open so on and so forth so i'm going to talk a little bit about the why the what the where the how the when and the who in just a second so let's talk about objectives behind everything there's always the objectives the goals so the north vancouver seed library's seed club lends out seeds to the public for free of charge and that was very important that was very important to us to make sure that we maintained and it was with the objectives to provide viable uh, viable and heritage seeds to the people in our community, to support the development of greener community spaces, to encourage people to grow their own food, to align with the city's commitment to sustainable li living, to, to promote self-reliance and stewardship, and facilitate community learning, sharing, and partnerships. So this was essentially the why of what we were going to be doing with our seed club and our seed library. So our seed club and our seed library. Now you're probably wondering what's the difference between a seed library and a seed club. Okay, um, in a nutshell, the seed club is the registration of participants and trying to follow through with what participants need and want, as well as provide them with opportunities to be involved with programs and programming at the library. So that's the seed club. So those are the people, okay? The seed library itself is more the collection. Okay, so in library land, we have programs, we have collections, we have readers wise, we reference, there's lots of administrative stuff, but libraries are built and based on collections, whether they be book collections, audiovisual collections, newspaper collections, ebook collections, so on and so forth. So our collection was going to be our seed, um, seed collection itself. So that's what our seed library is. So when a customer wants to take seeds out of the seed library collection, we ask them to join our seed club. So this basically entails going to a service desk in the library and speaking to a staff member who registers them online for our seed club. So it's basically just like, you know, like an online registration. We just ask people register for the seed club. That way it lets us know how many people are involved with us and how big the program would be. That will then eventually help define how much um, staff time input as well as uh, resources that we put into uh, facilitating and maintaining this collection itself. So basically, uh, the online form that we ask um, um, when we uh, have people register, we just essentially ask them simple stuff. First name, last name, phone number, library card number. And if they're interested in receiving any promotional emails regarding events, programs, and workshops that we hold that, that are related specifically to seed saving and gardening. New seed club registrants are given a welcome package that includes a brochure outlining how the seed club and seed library work as well as information related to seed saving, seed harvesting, and tips for growing plants from seeds. The information package also includes, uh, includes an updated gardening book list that we actually have with selected titles from our gardening and plants collection, and a list of links that would be helpful for budding gardeners and planting charts for vegetables, fruits and flowers, and herbs. And these are provided to us, um, a lot of these uh, like you know seed charts are provided to us from graciously 
uh, from the folks from West Coast Seeds. So that's a nice little partnership that we've had um, to be able to procure seeds as well as order seeds, so on and so forth. So when somebody registers, uh, they go to a desk, they register for the seed club. The staff member then takes the patron to the seed library cabinet and provides a brief orientation to how it's arranged and how seed envelopes and packages are signed out. Patrons are shown where useful books may be located as well as useful community information that the patron may be interested in following up with. So around our seed uh, library cabinet and collection, we actually have that housed conveniently in the gardening and plant section. And over there, that's where we put up all the local interest kind of stuff regarding like gardening clubs, um, as well as different events which are happening. So it kind of like is like a one stop shop place for people to go to to find out everything that they need to know. So essentially, this program works on the honor system. All we ask patrons to do is write down the date that they take out seeds and the number of packets they take and just a brief overview of the varieties. This helps us with determining what what is popular or what we what we may need to be what we may need to have to stock up on. Patrons are permitted to take as many seeds as they can. So on top of the seed cabinet where we have all the seed envelopes um, for people to take out, it's basically a quick and easy little sign-out sheet. Day able to monitor what's being used in the cabinet, what's not being used, uh, just at a glance. Hey, Walter, we've lost your sound. Um, can you guys hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you very much. Um, am I going too fast, you guys? Or am I fine? Okay, good. A little bit too fast. Okay, I'll try to slow it down. I always get to talk too quick. Okay, um, so as I said, seeds are given to patrons for free. We just ask that patrons harvest their seeds and donate them back to the library. And uh, we repackage them and make them available for other patrons so who are involved in the seed club. Uh, we're also interested in receiving donations of uh, viable and non-invasive seeds. Um, so if anybody has anything left over at home, just bring it into us. We'll get it repacked and reposted and re-put in. In general, we, we restock the seed cabinet once a month with around 200 to 205 seed packets of all varieties. We usually do this around the 25th of the month when we procure statistics. So. I'm gonna go back up though what it looks like. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So if you notice the cabinet that we use here, that is one of those old fashioned library card catalog cabinets that we haven't seen since the 60s or the 70s. And luckily, um, what's really funny is this cabinet itself has a bit of a history. It's just a small cabinet with about uh, 12 different drawers per se. And uh, when we went uh, online or when we kind of like, you know, went onto an online catalog, uh, we decided, all libraries decided to ditch their card catalog cabinets, which you now actually see in antique shops and things like that, and they cost an absolute fortune. This little cabinet we donated to like a local library, and they used it as a plant stand for about 30 years. And then they heard that we're going to be setting up a seed library, and they said, hey, did you want your cabinet back? And we're like, oh, I think we could probably use it for this little program. So this is actually what we do. We actually put all of our little seed packets into an old-fashioned card catalog cabinet. Very cute, very chic, very sexy, if you ask me. So you get an idea. So in each of the different drawers, we actually have it arranged by the type. So like this would be green, so that includes everything from arugula, lettuces, so on and so forth. And then we have other ones specifically for vegetables, some for fruits, some for dyes, uh, many for, uh, for ornamentals. And one of these days, I really want to put one in for experimentals. Mm -hmm. But I have to be careful with that because we have to do it legally now, apparently. Okay, so what it looks like, this is what the little seed packets look like themselves. Can you guys see all that? Okay, so they're essentially little envelopes that actually contain seeds. We put a little um, uh, label on each one. And uh, now these, I have to admit, are the older labels that we're using. So it actually included something like the common name, the variety, the year that they were packed, uh, where they came from, so on and so forth. It includes information about the city library, as well as edible garden project and uh, 
and other other agencies like the North Shore Neighbor Neighborhood House, which also helped support this program. So the neat thing is the little envelopes we had to order specifically, and they're the perfect size for a uh, size for a small amount of seats. And with putting the labels on, which we generate in house and print off as actually special size Avery labels using a color printer, we're able to kind of keep the the costs lower as well as the production um, at our, um, you know, like uh, available for us. So we don't have to wait for any printer to kind of come up and do this and all, so on and so forth. We have simplified uh, the little form that we have on here, which we just include the common name and the variety and the year and uh, the other basic information. So next slide here, what it looks like continued. If you notice really closely here, where we have actually this row of books. Um, this is actually known as our gardening and plants area. And unlike a lot of libraries, which have a linear uh, Dewey Decimal run, like from 001 to 999, a few years back, we decided to kiosk certain collections in which we kind of like pulled all the items from uh, certain subjects, clustered them together, similar to like a Bizac or kind of like a bookstore arrangement, but still using the Dewey, um, we would collect books together. So in our gardening and plants area, we use uh, books from the 580s, which is kind of like botany and, and things like that. From the 635s, which includes uh, items that you would actually find in uh, gardening and uh, planting. And then from the 712s uh, to the 719s, which is landscape architecture. So we have those all arranged Dewey wise in this area. And that was a perfect little place to put our little cabinet with seeds. So if people are going to be coming looking for seeds, more likely than not, they'll be looking for books on gardening. Since we've done this, actually, our nonfiction circulation has actually increased since we've um, since we've kiosked a lot of our collections. Uh, gardening of plants is actually holding on its own. And the nice thing about it is uh, the circulation has grown a bit. So that means that it provides us with justification for keeping our nonfiction fiction collections at the size that they are, if not growing them a little bit. On top of the cabinet, you can notice a few different binders and resources and things like that. That's where we keep uh, general information about specific seeds, uh, growing certain seeds. So we have a big binder which contains little envelopes with all the seed care instructions that we would get, as well as other types of things like what's happening locally with different seed programs and things like that, as well as seed clubs and gardening clubs. Okay, so what it looks like. Now, if you notice that happy little cabinet doesn't have a stand there. The nice thing about that little cabinet when it's full of seeds, you just have to get a flatbed truck, pull off the top and bang, you could do an outreach program with it. So this is what our seed um, our seed collection looks like when we go out into the plaza or to other agencies when we take our seeds with us. We provide um, information in terms of binders. Our growth charts are here, as well as the different brochures that we have available and different types of resources that people can use. Now, a lot of people ask us, okay, so you have your seed club and your seed uh, uh, collection all set up. What does it take to keep it running? So I actually had like a um, list of all the different duties that one would actually do all the time, just to make sure that we're kind of covering all the bases. So to keep a seed library running, this is what you have to really do. And this is this comes down to logistics. So that includes printing off and refilling brochure and information packages for new seed club members. We usually have those um, housed actually right on top of the cabinet where the seed collection is. And surprisingly, we fill that up like about once a week with about 20 of them and half of them are gone every week, even if we don't have a huge amount of people which are actually signing up for the seed club. So people are using the stuff and getting the information. The other thing is emptying our seed donation box located at our welcome desk. So we have a circulation desk, which we call the welcome desk. And that's where people could come in, drop off what seeds that they have uh, that we could repackage and put into our seed collection and other people can use. It's uh, filling and labeling seed envelopes with new seeds. I will say majority of the work, half the work for running the seed collection is on a regular basis. You fill up those little envelopes with the seeds and label them. OK, that's where actually a lot of the time is uh, going to be. Uh, we used to actually have um, like a really great inventory that was going and we were noticing that we we're spending more time on on maintaining this gorgeous inventory uh, spreadsheet and not enough time on filling the seed. So the cabinet was running kind of half empty, whereas we had it actually kind of all administratively looking perfect. End of the day, all you need to know is how many packets are going out, how many people are registering, how often is it used? 
So uh, as I said, filling and labeling seed envelopes with new seeds, restocking the seed cabinet with new seed envelopes and ensuring that available um, envelopes of seeds are still viable. So on a monthly basis, we quickly just flip through there. We check out all the dates and all the years and all that. And we actually have a chart to figure out, okay, you know what? These seeds have been here for way too long. Get rid of the old ones. We should get uh, add in some new ones. Other tasks that are involved with keeping this running would be keeping track and taking note of what types of seeds may need to be replenished and or added to the seed library cabinet. So when we're actually doing our little inventory, if we notice, oh, wow, there's a whole lot of beans, but not a lot of tomatoes. There's a whole lot of radicchio, but not a lot of radishes. That lets us know. So when we're doing our monthly stats, we kind of just jot down where things are running thin. When we go back to repackage seeds, we actually have an inventory hidden away in the back. That's when we kind of dig through, repackage that stuff up, put them out. So uh, count and recording number of statistics related to memberships and how many seed envelopes have been taken out. I'll be talking a little bit more about this in just a second. Uh, taking inventory of supplies and following through with getting supplies replenished as required. We usually do that about twice a year just to make sure we have enough of those envelopes. Now for those nice little uh, Avery labels printed up, enough of like the packages of information that would be with the brochures, so on and so forth, as well as making sure we have enough seeds. OK, I kind of find when it comes to uh, running a seed library, when you have your inventory, it's either feast or famine. So you have to make sure that you kind of balance it out to make sure you have a good stock available at all times, but not too over the top that you have a bunch of seeds sitting in the back, which are kind of like, you know, basically like wasting away. So maintaining inventory of seeds that we have that require packaging. As I said, it's just go through there once in a while, make sure everything is all tickety-boo, make sure that there isn't any kind of infestation that could be happening. And that um, has happened in the past with some kind of like, you know, insects. Uh, and thanks, thank gosh, we haven't had a mouse problem because we have them nicely packed up and tightly packed away so they're not accessible to almost anybody or anything. Um, assist with procurement or purchase of seeds as required. So usually we're trying, we're in the perfect world, we would be living off of actually having received or um, donated seeds given to us. But I do have to admit, I do spend a little bit of money every year uh, by buying fresh seeds from uh, different agencies such as West Coast Seeds. I might spend anywhere from 400 to 800 a year uh, buying seeds, and that actually comes out of the general collection budget, which sounds a little bit rich. However, West Coast Seeds is a very, very, very generous institution, and they actually have a um, they actually have um, a program set up in which they will donate seeds to different line uh, to different agencies such as nonprofit agencies, libraries for seed collections, so on and so forth. So what I like to do is I like to order maybe twice a year and then ask once a year for a donation, uh, so on and so forth. Because I think you know what if they're supporting us, we've got to support them too. So finally, uh, providing assistance or materials programmers. Uh, so that's like for gardening programs, CD Saturday events, uh, events in our library plaza or for outreach events, so on and so forth. So the person which we have involved with the seed library will actually help support them by getting like, you know, a seed envelopes all set up, uh, extra information packages, so on and so forth. So general supplies which are required, uh, the initial supplies that we required for this program, uh, we had to find out where we we're going to house the collection. So we had to find a cabinet of some sort. Some people actually use like a filing cabinet. Some people just use like a simple like shoe boxes or kind of like um, a sterilite bins or Rubbermaid bins. Um, I like the idea that we had a cute little cabinet because um, we're still a library after all. Uh, we had to get Avery labels. So those are the labels for which we would mark down everything, you know, either type them up or write them down for the, the variety of seeds in the year, the small envelopes themselves. And surprisingly, that was a bit of a tricky thing because those old fashioned library card catalog cabinets, they're supposed to be three to five, but really there are two seven eighths by four and seven eighths. So you have to find the right size envelopes that would actually to fit in there and it did take me a little while but I found it through a company called Uline and they're basically uh, coin envelopes that banks use. Uh, we had to create and print off uh, brochures for the registration packages. We had to get our hands on seeds, uh, storage bins for keeping our inventory um, in the back as well as signage. So that was one of the initial things. And then for ongoing, we just have to make sure every once in a while we top up our Avery labels that we print off in-house, get some more of those small envelopes and get more seeds, seeds, seeds. So statistics. So this is what we track. Now, initially we were getting a little bit complex and thinking, oh, well, we should track this, we should track that, so on and so forth. End of the day, what is important for us, what the library board needs to see and what uh, kind of like, you know, gives the real kind of like, you know, bread and butter facts as well as stats comes down to this. 
It's always good to know about the number of seed envelopes that have been taken out of that cabinet or from that collection in a month. Uh, you should also count the number of new seed envelopes that you pack or add to the seed library cabinet. The number of seed envelopes in the library cabinet itself after you add in the new one. So what we basically do is we go in there, we count how many are left, and we just basically minus that number from how many seed packets we had the, year, uh, the month before. That tells us how many seed packets probably went out. We add in the new seed packets, count that up, tells us how many we have. And then, so that's for the collection itself. For the registrants, as I said, you've got your collection, you've got your people. So it's always nice to know the total number of seed registrants you have, as well as no, the total number of new seed registrants over the month. Surprisingly, I thought that, oh, you have a lot during like the spring, maybe the summer, so on and so forth. It's year round. People are signing up for this year round and doing seeding and um, planting all around the year. Of course, the fall and winter, you'll have a little bit less. But as I said, with North Vancouver having a high population of folks that actually live in, you know, condos or apartments or, you know, multifamily dwellings, there's a lot of terrace and patio gardening going on. So, uh, so it's like a neat little thing. It's not like your traditional backyard garden. It's kind of like the garden that you have in your home. So aspects of community engagement. I like those little scarecrows. They're not as scary as most scarecrows. So what worked well, uh, oh, sorry, aspects of community engagement. Let me just get to this here. Okay. So in terms of community engagement, I'm gonna go back up there. Um, there's three aspects that we should actually mention in terms of community engagement. One of them is collection access, uh, programs and partnerships, and promotions and social media. So as I said, we have our cabinet, which is available um, basically as the library is open, like all the hours the library is open, that's when the cabinet is available and people can access our seed collection. And we have it available, uh, not hidden away in the back, not for something some, for us to bring out when somebody asks. We have it available in our stacks with our collections. Um, so as I mentioned, we kiosk your collections, so for, in the gardening and plants area, and uh, it does contain all the books like in the 580s, the 635s, 712s, the 719s. Uh, within that area, we also provide community information resources relating to gardening clubs, seed saving, and local horticulture. For programs and partnerships, we actively work on programs and partnerships with the Edible Garden Project, with the North Shore Neighborhood House, sometimes with West Coast Seeds and with other gardening and horticulture based um, uh, agencies. I know this past summer, we actually did one with the local uh, Squamish Nation uh, discussing things such as um, uh, West Coast uh, traditional plants. And uh, I hate using the term ethnobotany, plants which are actually used for medicinal or other purposes, uh, which have been, or have been traditionally used by local um, First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And that was actually quite an interesting program because it kind of really like broke down that barrier between like libraries institution, you know, um, and other agencies. And basically what we were doing was helping su support, provide, and uh, develop uh, like heritage or kind of like localized collections. And we, that's something we could really probably delve more into. Now, in terms of our seed club and our seed library, things sometimes work well, sometimes they don't, and uh, sometimes you just got to fix things. So this is probably the important area to listen to, because I think we always have like really great ideas and intentions, but sometimes that road to hell is paved with those good intentions. So. Overall, we've been very pleased with how our seed library um, and seed uh, collection have actually developed over the years. But actually, um, I do have to admit, I'm rather shocked at how it's really developed in popularity. And we've been amazed by the support of the local community with this project. Um, a lot of this could be attributed to our ongoing programming and promotion of these materials. And word of mouth uh, has really helped as well. In retrospect, I would say that there were a number of things that worked well or that we did right. And there were a number of things that didn't really work right, but we did try to rectify these issues. And now I can say that things are running pretty tickety-boo, actually. It's actually, uh, uh, they used to be kind of like, you know, my big headache once a month, but now it's like, wow, look, look, look what we're doing. Look what's happening. Look how it's being used. So for items that have worked, uh, we made sure to plan out this project with detailed policies and guidelines and procedures related to how to do it, how to run it, how to maintain it. We also made certain that we worked um, on this with folks from the Edible Garden Project and other agencies, such as the folks from West Coast Seeds, 
initially when you start this up, try to work on it as a partnership. If eventually you know that it's probably going to end up falling in your lap, that you're going to be maintaining it and sustaining it, fine. But start with the partnerships, okay? That's the very important thing because, as I said, to develop it, uh, to develop it, to maintain it, to grow it, you need that word of mouth. And the more people in town that know about it, that could talk about it, that could promote it, the better off you are. Um, having a uh, seed library co collection conveniently located um, in the stacks with the collection, so within our gardening and plants area, uh, was also a very smart move. It made sure that we were achieving our goal of giving patrons access, so it's the accessibility thing that was really important um, to these resources, and making sure that it was done year-round, and giving people the opportunity to browse and discover on their own, okay? Like saying that we have a seed collection hidden in the back or just brought out for special events, fine and dandy, but if you actually have it available there for everyone to just pick through as they walk by, great. Sooner or later, if somebody's interested or, or thinking, well, I should grab some or whatever, sooner or later, they're going to join in. Um, the, old, the old card catalog cabinet that we got was also the perfect thing for this collection, and it created a lot, um, and uh, creating a lot of our materials in-house, so our resources, such as the labels and like your little envelopes, was also great because it gave us real control over uh, printing off and uh, procuring what we needed um, without having to rely on an outside agency, like, you know, having to go to a printer or anything like that. And I think most libraries understand that. The more things you can kind of do in-house on your own, have your templates already, the better off you are, okay? So you're not reliant on anybody. Um, also, knowing that this collection would also require some ongoing maintenance and commitment, we decided to budget for the purchase of new seeds to keep the inventory up to snuff. As I said, we spend about 400 to about 800 a year on this. Uh, we're very lucky, North Vancouver City, City Library. We, we are blessed with a wonderful um, collection budget, as well as a little bit of flexibility of how I could actually code things to when I buy them. So uh, this, um, as I said, um, Besides books and audiovisual materials and magazines and newspapers, we have other types of collections, non-traditional collections that has to be factored in. So it's not going to be running for uh, for free. And the other thing about this is you have to make sure that you're on top of it all the time. Okay, so items that didn't work out as planned. Okay, with all, as I said, with all new initiatives, there's sometimes things that you weren't expecting. So the things that didn't work out when we first introduced the seed collection and the seed club. There were a number of these, but the main ones that, um, looking back, I kind of wish that we would have realized would have been coming down the pike, but we did fix them. I'll talk about that in a second. So I would say one of them was being naive and thinking that partnerships and sharing work would be ongoing. I just assumed that, like, you know, our partnerships would be lasting forever, you know, so on and so forth, so um, and all that. In truth, partnerships only last as long as the folks who are involved in making the commitment stick around to begin with. Edible Garden Project, it is a nonprofit agency as well as a North Shore neighborhood house. Things work great when you have somebody who's committed right from the start, but if there's a change in staffing, which is called life, then you have to kind of juggle the dishes about, you know, who's going to be looking after what now. Uh, another thing which I wish I would have thought of initially was not realizing that cumbersome details such as print registration forms and tracking sheets for seed club registrants uh, could actually defeat the purpose. When we first started this, we actually had a registration as a print thing. So people would come to our information desk, they would sign up uh, to register as a seed library registrant, and then we would have them uh, give them a little log that in a different binder, which they would sign up to mark down what they took out, how many, so on and so forth. Cumbersome, cumbersome, cumbersome. And people started to find that to be a bit of a pain in the butt. They'd be spending more time signing out stuff than they did grabbing their stuff. And I thought, you know what, we have to simplify this. That's why I said in my statistics, end of the day, all you need to know is how many, how many of those envelopes go out, the kinds of things that go out, how many add to the cabinet, how many registrants you have in the C club and how many registered that month. That's all you need to know. Like if 50 envelopes of tomatoes go out, great. If one you know envelope of radishes go out, great. Not the hill I'm going to die on. I just want to know at the end of the day, how many of those envelopes are going out. Okay. Um, another mistake. And I have to be careful treading on this one because I know some people think that this is sacrosanct, but uh, believing that this could be overseen and administered ongoing by volunteers, big mistake on my part, um, as well as assigning uh, it to a specific staff member um, who might go rogue. If you give it to a staff member to look after, make sure that staff member understands the uh, 
policies, procedures, guidelines of exactly what you're trying to do. We always have good intentions to create inventories and things like that, but I was finding that a staff member I had that was running this was focusing on that beautiful inventory as opposed to filling up the cabinet. So we have to kind of make sure that's a little bit of give and take. Um, volunteers are great, but the thing is volunteers are only as reliable as for how long they're volunteering. And I was finding that I was training and retraining and training and retraining people on the same thing. So I thought, you know what, it's best to just administer this in the house and make it as part of our, one of our regular collections. Thinking, uh, another mistake was thinking that a detailed inventory needed to be done. Um, and the final thing, which we weren't uh, expecting, was becoming a victim of our own success. There came a time when we had difficulties in really stocking that cabinet, like back in March and April and May and June. There were like 400 of those seed uh, packets going out, and like that cabinet held maybe 500 seed packets. So I was thinking, okay, we're spending a lot of time packing these seeds. And I was thinking, how are we going to have this, um, the, you know, how are we going to maintain, you know, uh, the sustainability of this? So, in order to fix the issues, this is what we did. We streamlined registration procedures as well as the way which we asked C-Club members to record number of packets that they took out. So we went from print registrations to online registrations. And the online registrations is basically like a little form sack kind of thing. So, you know, they come to a desk and they say, hey, I want to join the C-Club. We're like, great. Okay, we'll just open up the little form. First name, last name, library card number, phone number. Do you want to be contacted? It's all of the information we need. And they'll actually follow up once a month through the form sack to find out how many people registered or how many registrants we had. Um, also going on the honor system, if somebody takes seats out of the seat cabinet and forgets or neglects to write down what they're taking, fine, you know, on, on a little checkout sheet, I'm not worried about that because we still do a quick little uh, read through or uh, count through every month. Uh, the other important thing that we did that was smart was we decided to actually sit down and document clear and defined procedures to follow for each of the various tasks related to the maintenance and oversight of the seed library collection. And we made sure to, to determine how, how much time was needed for each. That way we could actually plan out monthly how much time we have to commit to this and stick to that. Uh, we just the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> we decided to say, you know, as much as we love having an inventory, just drop the inventory, okay? You know, you don't need that inventory to find out how many, like, you know, you know, cherry tomatoes you have vis-a-vis -vis grape tomatoes, vis-a-vis beefsteak tomatoes, so on and so forth. And then we also folks focus on the most important tasks and decided to spend most of our time doing that, which was filling up those seed envelopes and putting them out. Um, we also figured out that we saved programming. Like we tried to do the programming on our own as the collection people. And we thought, you know what? We have our programming folks that do way better job and have better connections that we do to doing this stuff. So we left the programming all to them. When they do their program, we provide them with the resources that they need. And uh, as I said, finally, assign this task to one specific staff member who is trained in doing this and actually enjoys doing it as well. Once you have that buy-in, you got it made. Now, questions, but we might be saving questions to the very, very end. I hope you actually, you folks were able to uh, um, gain some information or some insight on how to do this. And if you have any ideas of, uh, of what to do or any questions of, uh, uh, for, for this, please let me know. Okay. Thank you, Walter. Uh, we do have those resources, Walter. Did you want me to share those with everyone? Yes. Um, yeah. As I said, a lot of the resources which I've actually created, um, I'm a librarian and I'm one of those librarians that love to share. So I provided the resources to Sarah and Sarah can make them available to anybody. That includes uh, templates for our Avery labels, uh, information for where to procure materials, the information on how to, uh, on the different tasks and duties that you should do monthly, as well as other things like that. So folks, feel free. They're all yours to copy, paste, do whatever you want. If you, need, if you have any specific questions, just let me know, okay? Thank you. I think we'll we'll just maybe run through the questions in the chat really quickly, and then we'll make sure we have enough time um, for Melanie, and then we'll take all the questions at the end. Um, okay, I'll but... stop sharing here too. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so first question is, do they have to pay if they want to be a member of the C-Club? Okay, that's a very good question. No, no, we want to do this for free. Uh, the nice thing about libraries is open access to 
resources, materials, books, uh, information, entertainment. And for me, this is a part of our collections. So it is access to seeds for free. Um, what we're trying to do is maintain a collection in which we have a lot of materials which are donated from the public, which we could actually basically repackage and use. And as I said, I'm looking for us to actually purchase some of these materials to maintain this because it really supports the mandate of the library, supports the mandate of the official city plan, uh, for creating viable green and sustainable spaces, as well as protecting things such as um, uh, food safety. So it's free. Great, thank you. And Gulf Islands, I uh, was just asking about the monthly stats that you collect, but you did touch on those. And um, if anyone needs a, a copy of those, just let me know and I can pull them out from Walter's presentation. But, yeah, I'm not sure if I mentioned, um, so currently our seed library registrants is at about 425. Um, 400 to 425, we're finding that we have anywhere from about five to 10 a month join in as new registrants. Um, on average, we're circulating about 200 um, packets a month, but I would say definitely in the spring, it could go up to about 300 even more. Great. And someone also asked the envelopes, but those were from Uline. Uline. Yeah. Uline is actually uh, an agency that um, focuses on providing uh, print products, mainly envelopes, forms, uh, NCR paper, like kind of like doing um, printed forms, as well as um, envelopes and uh, paper stock. Now, the thing is, since I had the cabinet, I had to find a specific size to use for an envelope. And that was the hardest part. So that's why I had to source them from Uline. We get them in, I think, packages about, I believe it's 500. And we usually probably go through about four packages, which is about 2000 a year. And I think that they're about... <sighs> Don't quote me, I think they're about $60 each. So between the seeds, as well as the um, resources, like Avery labels, envelopes, um, we're probably spending about a thousand, maybe 1200 a year, which sounds very rich. But as I said, um, for our community, we find that that works. And um, we do have actually a very good um, uh, materials budget, which I'm able to work around in different magical ways with. So we're quite lucky. This is also, think of this also as an opportunity for um, maybe a Friends of the Library group or a uh, thing that could be provided through donations or grants or, or the type of thing that we could support that way, maybe through um, the library board uh, when they're doing fundraising. Great. Thank you. And I think we'll hand it over to Melanie and thanks for your questions, everyone. If you do think of something else, feel free to put it in the chat and we will get to them all at the end of um, both panelists' presentations. So I will hand it over to you, Melanie. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm a last minute uh, participant, so I don't actually have a PowerPoint, but I do have some visual aids and yeah, lots of information, hopefully. Um, but let me know if you'd like to know something that I'm not speaking about. So I'm actually at UBC right now. My home computer isn't fast enough. Um, so I'm on the unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And UBC is its own municipality. So in theory, we're part of the city of Vancouver, but we do not pay city of Vancouver taxes. We have our own RCMP, fire department, um, et cetera. So UBC is a little bit different than um, other parts of the lower mainland. And that also impacts our, our seed library to some degree. So um, the University of British Columbia it has community members that live um, within the endowment lands that are not students. And so our seed library caters both to students, faculty, and staff at the university, as well as the people that live here. And there are about I think around 11,000 community members that are not necessarily associated with the university that live here. And then we can have upwards of 30,000 students um, September to April that we also um, service. So we have fluctuating numbers, which also um, impacts our seed library as well. And UBC has approximately 15 different libraries, but our seeds are only available at two of them. Uh, one is the Education Library, where the Seed Library started back in 2017. And then the other one is where I am right now at the Woodward Biomedical Library. So um, we, we outreach to a lot of science students as well as education students. Those are the two groups that 
we thought would most benefit from the seed library, but eventually we would like to have the seed library available at more of the library branches. But there are a lot of issues associated with that that I will talk about a bit later. So in terms of the background of our seed library, um, the idea started in around 2016. Uh, Wendy Trass, who's um, one of the librarians at the Education Library, she was also living on campus and realized that there were a lot of people living on campus who weren't necessarily students that could benefit from seeds and community gardens in general. Um, even though we have a lot of wild space around UBC, um, people can always use gardens and food security and um, that sort of thing. So she thought, wouldn't it be great if we could kind of marry the student population and the community population in terms of a love of growing things? and use it also as an educational tool, both for the people living on campus as well as students. So it officially started in 2017 and seed libraries in general are less common in academic libraries than they are in public libraries. And there are a lot of similarities between the two, but there are also quite a few differences. So Wendy was trying to find certain models that she could use for our setting of an academic library. And so she chose the sort of pop-up um, public library model um, because we didn't know if we would get funding or how long we could do this. So she just started out thinking that it might be a pop-up at the education library. And then we would go from there. So um, there were also, problems in terms of how to fit it in an academic library context, how to justify its existence to the powers that be here. Um, so there were several different things that we had to, to think about. So um, also Helen Brown, she is one of the librarians here at Woodward. Um, they started talking and Helen thought that it would be a great support to the science students that we, we service. Woodward Library services about 60% of the UBC library population. So it services students in land and food systems, general science, botany, forestry, all, all kinds of different faculties. So she thought that it would be a really good complement um, to the programming going on in all those faculties if we had one central mm -hmm. place where they could get seeds and learn, um, et cetera. So the two of them got together and thought, okay, what do we need to do first? And funding was one of the first activities. So there are quite a few grants that are available um, to both the community and students out here at UBC. So they decided to apply for a grant called um, the U-Town grant. So U-Town means university town. So it wasn't actually an academic grant that they got at first. So it's the University Neighborhood Association that puts it on. So they thought it was a great idea to actually be able to give um, community members at UBC access to seeds that they could use in their own gardens, creating their own community gardens. So that was how it first started. And so we used that grant money for the original seed purpose, um, purchase, sorry. And so the first place that they got their seeds from was the BC Eco Seed Co-op. And then we thought, okay, uh, UBC has a farm located on campus and they have organic seeds. And we thought, okay, how about approach them, see if we could do another partnership with them in terms of education and people would know more about the UBC farm, would wanna get more involved. So we started getting um, organic seeds from the UBC farm. And then the third place is West Coast Seeds. So those are our three main um, places where we buy our seeds, but UBC farm actually donates 100% of their seeds to us, which is amazing. And then we also get um, patron donations as well, as well as people that have taken the seeds, they've saved them and then they bring them back to us. So there's sort of five main ways that we get our seeds at the moment. 
And so after reaching out to the UBC farm, um, we wanted to do as much community outreach as possible. Um, so we started a, a seed library committee. And so before the pandemic, it looked a lot different now than once students and faculty have come back on campus. But when it first started, we had a lot more activity, a lot more events. So I believe there were about 10 people on the original seed library uh, committee. There are now only four. <laughs> so um, one of our challenges is to get more um, staff involvement, staff and faculty involvement in the seed library because a lot dropped off when everyone came back to campus last September. And so we've been trying to promote it a bit more and figuring out where we want to go with this, what we want to achieve with it. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. So the Faculty of Education, where it first started, is very involved in the Seed Library. There are quite a few faculty members that are using it for quote unquote, guerrilla gardening. So they're taking their students around campus and just choosing areas that have been just left <laughs> to weeds and whatnot to actually create community gardens on campus. So that's used also as a teaching tool. And uh, the Faculty of Education uses it a lot with student teachers. So um, having classes where they learn how to go into their placement schools and potentially teach gardening, teach how to create a garden, um, what's involved in gardening so that they can teach their students. So we use that definitely as an educational tool. Um, we also are planning with the Library Climate Action Team, which is another committee on campus, we're thinking of doing our own community garden right outside the Woodward Library, actually. It's a very wild space. And so we're thinking of involving the entire campus community, faculty, staff, students, and they can come and help create a garden. So we're in the process of getting permission to do that. But that's another outreach activity that can involve everybody, including um, non-students and non-faculty and staff on campus as well. We're planning to promote it as soon as we get permission uh, very widely. So hopefully that will be a success. Um, so a lot of, um, in terms of the Woodward Library for the science part of things, they use it a lot in teaching modules. Um, several of the librarians here um, teach it in their their library classes and a lot of science students come want to find out more information. It allows them to get to know the library. So we're using it also as a door to the library, as well as a door to learning about gardening. So we've had a lot of success with that. And a lot of people come in, I just heard about this. What is this about? How can I get involved? So it's, it's a great way to promote. Um, and also have it be a learning tool for the students as well. So we also use it as part of Science Literacy Week. So every September is Science Literacy Week and Woodward puts on a lot of different events as well as other ones on campus. And so we always promote the Seed Library during that. And we have little pop-ups around campus where people can grab seeds and learn about what the Seed Library does. They can sign up and it's been really successful. But in the future, we would like to have more activities like that, um, little pop-up ones around campus where more students can get involved and learn about what we're doing. Um, so to be continued. <laughs> so we have a lot of communication between um, the Education Seed Library and the Woodward Seed Library. There, right now there are two people, myself and Helen at the Woodward Library, and then Wendy and one other person at the Education Library. So even though we're a very small group, we're trying to do as much as we, we possibly can. And it's, it's a challenge with only four people. So um, Walter's system is extremely organized and it sounds amazing but we have pretty much no funding. It's all done by um, staff who already have a lot of other things to do. Um, it's, 
yeah, it's a little bit more underground here at the university than it is in, in the public library. So we've kind of had to be really creative with our staff time and try and make the most out of what we have. So yeah, a lot of challenges, but hopefully eventually we can be as organized as Walter. <laughs> so um, the Faculty of Land and Food Systems is one of the biggest uh, users and proponents of the Seed Library at Woodward. Um, a lot of their researchers use it as sort of as a, a living laboratory. So the Woodward Seed Library is making research outputs available to students in the same way that we make books and journals available. So it's literally um, a direct link with what Land and Food Systems is learning with the, the general outcome of that. We have um, hybrid seeds that have been created on campus that we're giving out to the general community um, so they can see what actually happens with those seeds. Um, it, it's been really interesting actually. And it's totally different than in a public library context because a lot of our seed library is used for research and teaching purposes. Um, the general community uses it a lot. I would say it's about 50-50 um, community membership and um, staff, faculty, and student membership. But um, yeah, it's been interesting to see how different from a public library context that the seed library is being used in an academic setting. And yes, yeah, so both Education and Woodward do several outreach programs a year. Um, we're hoping to do more once we get more staff involved, um, but right now we do probably about three to four a year. Um, each library and a lot of times we partner up and so we do joint events. Um, either hosted here at Woodward or hosted at the Education Library. And they're usually quite successful. We have a lot of students and staff come, as well as a lot of community members. The Education Library gets a lot of daycare uh, students that are in the, the non-student uh, population. And they come and learn what a seed is, how to grow it, they also have a very large tower garden that was part of a grant that we applied for a couple of years ago. And so they can actually take pieces of kale and you know, tomatoes and whatnot that is actually grown on the tower garden and learn how, how vegetables grow from a seed up. So we've used the tower garden a lot in our outreach activities and we're hoping to potentially get another one for here at Woodward. Right now it's housed only at the Education Library. So in terms of management, like Walter, we're using a repurposed uh, card catalog. So both the Education Library and Woodward Library have a repurposed card catalog. So what we did is we took out the, the vertical partitions and we just have the space. And then we've just put the the different containers um, of seeds in those. And so each card catalog has six different levels. Um, the first four are for vegetables. Um, the second one is for herbs. And the last one is for flowers. So most people, what they take out are vegetable seeds, but we also have herb and flower seeds that are available. And so I would say about 80% of what people take are vegetable seeds, but the other 20 are divided between the flower and the herb seeds. So hopefully we will get a little bit more variety in the future. I think Walter has a lot more variety at North Van Public than, than we do. But what we do stress is that we are only taking organic seeds. So that somewhat limits the donations that we're getting, um, but we think it's important um, to only have organic So patrons, it's self-service basically. So when they come in, they see the card catalog. There is this form here, which we have, which is the borrower form. And basically all we're asking for is their name, their email address, the date that they took out the seeds, the type of seeds and the approximate amount. So we're saying a maximum of 75 seeds per um, per type of seed that they're taking out. 
So it's very much on the honor system. Uh, we just don't have the staff to sort of police it more, more than that. <laughs> so we also have these little plastic baggies. And so we have those at the card catalog and they basically fill them themselves. They, they fill this out themselves and then they bring it to the circulation desk. And then we enter it into a Qualtrics um, survey management system. And that's the online part of what we're doing. And then we organize the information from Qualtrics and then we separate it for the, the Woodward Library and the Education Library. And then we wind up with Excel spreadsheets. Um, we haven't had a lot of time to do that recently, but I do have the updated information from the Education Library. So from January 1st to now, um, approximately 2,000 seeds have been borrowed. Um, again, that's based on um, what people say they're taking. Um, there have been 17 donations that were not from the UBC farm. And there are 49 new borrowers just from the education library since January. So we think that it's coming back quite well since the pandemic, but we do need to do a lot more promotion work. Um, but that's better than we thought, basically. And in terms of the types of seeds that are most likely to go out, um, for them, it would be kale, lettuce, beans, peas, tomatoes are, are the most popular. Um, of slightly more herbs than, than flowers are going out, but there are, are some flowers because a lot of um, students are doing container gardening in their dorms. So what we're planning to try and do is a student focused workshop next year that is on container gardening so that they realize that even if they have a small space, they can still grow things. And yeah, I think a lot of students hopefully will, will take advantage of that. So at Woodward, even though I don't have updated statistics, um, it is quite widely used. Um, it's just not used as much from the community as the education library is, because the education library is also used as a children's library for the, um, the population, the non-student population of UBC. So a lot of families come in there that wouldn't come into Woodward. So it's a slightly different demographic, but, um, but both are, are very well used. And yeah, usually the events that we hold are very well attended, although they could always be more well attended. So we're trying to figure out how best to promote things. Because right now in our academic library, it's a little bit difficult to promote non-academic pursuits. Um, so we have digital signage in all of our libraries. And so we've been given permission to promote events on our digital signage. And we also actually create paper posters. We, we go around to all the different libraries, um, giving them posters. We also have event information at each of the card catalog seed libraries. Um, but we're trying to think of more creative ways to promote things because it doesn't necessarily reach the complete audience that we are going for. So that is something that we're, we're going to work on. So uh, UBC has found that having a seed library on campus is delivering on its strategic plan of engagement with the community. So at first it didn't really know what to make of this. Um, it, it let us go forward, but now, um, there's more enthusiasm from the, the academic um, board of governors, for example. So I think that we'll be able to do more events in the future because they see that this is promoting their strategic plan. So we're excited about that because it took a while for them to figure out sort of what we were doing and how this was working, but I think they're pleased with what we're doing so far. Um, and it's also for the academic uh, community an opportunity for experiential learning for teaching and instruction, as well as highlighting ongoing research that's happening at the university. So we really do think it's win-win for everybody um, to have this on campus and hopefully it will expand in the future. So 
so yeah, if anybody has any questions, sorry, it was a lot shorter than Rich <laughs> than Walters, but <laughs> that was great, Melanie. Thank you. Um, I can, if, if folks want to put their questions, keep putting them in the chat, that would be great. And I can run through them that way. And then we can also open up um, the Zoom here if anyone wants to pop on and ask their question directly. But we have about 20 minutes left. So I would love to get, get um, to all the questions here. Uh, I actually so have one more thing that I can oh, yes, mention sure. if that's okay. So in, in terms of our statistics, um, the information that we're capturing is um, the year that the seed was harvested, because um, normally seeds go out of date within three to five years. So we're just trying to um, figure out exactly when that was harvested. We're asking for the variety, the type, the amount of seeds, um, the location, so Woodward or education. And, and those are the, the main things, just simply because we don't have the staff to um, ask a lot of super detailed questions, but we think that those capture most of what we're looking for. Great, thank you, Melanie. Um, so this question is kind of just tied in what, to what you mentioned. I saw Walter nodding, so perhaps both have the same answer to it, but um, how do you decide if a seed is past expiry date? So Melanie just mentioned you're sort of three to five years and you're tracking that on your envelopes? That, yes, we, yeah. we are. And then anything that is slightly out of that range, we're actually um, giving those seeds to people at, at workshops and we're telling them that, you know, you might have some success, but it may not, like not all the seeds may um, come to fruition, but this sort of gives them an opportunity to just try and we've had feedback saying that a lot of them still are, are good, but we are telling them that they are potentially expired, so. Okay, thank you. And Walter, how are you tracking that at North Vancouver? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, luckily, the great folks at West Coast Seeds provided us with a chart to determine the viability of seeds, like how old seeds should be. So uh, on each of the different envelopes that we have, we usually try to put down the year uh, if not the year and the month of when we actually packaged up the seeds and often we don't know how old the seeds are so we try to just use the date that we packaged it unless if we determined or we're able to determine how old the seeds were we'll put that actually on the package and uh when we do our monthly kind of like review or our kind of like inventory when we're taking our stats that's when we kind of quickly flip through and say okay if anything's really more than three years let's pull this compared against the chart that we got from West Coast Seeds saying like, for example, basil seeds good for five years, tomato seeds good for three years. So I'm, I'm pulling these out of the, <laughs> pulling these out of the air. So we try to compare that way. Um, I think it's okay for a little bit older on some of the seeds, but I'm finding with the amount of seeds which are going out and rotating, it works quite well. Um, also, I just want to add it in. I, we're finding that when we're determining the types of seeds that we want to pick, we're finding the vegetables, vegetable, well, mainly like vegetables, meaning fruits and vegetables, but mainly vegetables uh, is probably about 80% of our stock, but 10% would probably be ornamentals. And then the other 5%, sorry, uh, the other 10% would probably be herbs, herbs, but herbs are popular. So uh, the neat thing is in terms of variety for herbs, we maybe have about 15 to 20. Total amount of variety uh, that we actually have for different types of seeds in our cabinet is probably about 125 mostly uh, vegetables, as I said, um, a sum for the ornamentals. There was a question about getting into those medicinal or experimentals. And I have to say, when we were first starting the seed library, that was at about the time when things started becoming a little bit legal in Canada for doing things, but uh, the uh, procurement as well as um, uh, distribution of seeds for things such as cannabis is actually, I believe, legally kind of covered. So we can't delve into that. And believe me, I didn't want, like, part of me want to be the librarian that did that, but part of me thought, I don't want to be the librarian that does that. So as soon as that happens, that's when we're going to start delving into that. But believe me, we're actually on the, the, um, we're on the edge, just waiting for the moment we can do that. And then we'll start doing that kind of stuff if we can. We'll have to have I'm you back, Walter. Yeah. 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 yeah, we'll have I you just, back when that happens. I just wanted to quickly chime in about the when to know if your seeds are old. Um, and I, I noticed somebody here is asking him for the, the chart from West Coast Seeds. And there's lots of other charts out there. And I'll just say that those are always guidelines. Um, they could be not viable earlier than the date, and they can last much longer than the date. Mm -hmm. 
Um, doing germ tests regularly would be the best way to manage that, but totally understandable that that's a huge amount of work for any library to take on. So I think you're doing, I think you've come up with a good solution. And I would also, yeah, just recommend that those seeds could still go out with a warning yeah. label saying they might oh, not be sure. vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I said, we try to sustain this whole uh, program or project as we can. And initially, I thought it was going to just be something small, use a little bit here and there. But it's really, it is really kind of like developed and grown. And it's something that we're thinking, okay, we didn't expect that this is going to be quite as big as important as we thought. In terms of actually maintaining the seed collection, um, it kind of depends upon the month, it depends upon the different types of things that we need to do. Like, as I said, I have that little list of like the different things you need, but I, I would say if you commit a good, for a library our size, 10 to 12 hours a month, uh, maintaining this, I would say a good hour would be doing the stats as well as refilling the cabinet, so on and so forth. Half that time is going to be filling up those little seed packets. Um, and we try to fill up the seed packets appropriately. I always say 10 to 12 seeds per thing, but if the seeds are smaller, put some in and put extra in. If they're bigger seeds, maybe just use fewer, so on and so forth. Um, it's not a perfect science. It is, and remember, it is also done by honor system. Uh, we try to keep free and open access and we try to do our best with it. Um, perfect world, we would have organic seeds. Uh, we provide what we can, uh, hence the reason why I try to buy a lot of seeds from West Coast Seeds because I know what we get from them is good and it's viable. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything else. I know that there were some other questions that we had. I would say probably the most circulation that we have is definitely for the vegetables, uh, vegetable varieties, very, very similar to what Melanie had mentioned. So lots of tomatoes, lots of beans, lots of peas, um, herbs like such as uh, basil, tarragon, um, uh, the greens with arugula, lettuces. Uh, we also have lots of onions and peppers for some reason. Those are popular. The ornamentals, like the flowers, like I, I love flowers, right? But uh, they don't seem to go as much. And the flowers that do go seem to be more things like marigolds for some reason, which is what, whatever. It's I guess they're the pretty hardy little things. I mean, the only, like... Uh, when it comes to gardening, my partner's more of a gardener. The only thing I could probably really grow is a dandelion. So, so it's kind of neat. So I'm good with the collections and the organizing with things. But when it comes to the actual doing of it, I pass that to the programmers because they're, they're probably ones that do it best for us. The types of programs that we do offer, uh, we have um, every, uh, I would say season, we try to have a, a CD Saturday. So it's one of the local agencies which actually work with us in which they actually provide kind of like seeding, harvesting uh, projects um, and, uh, and workshops for the local folk. We also do a lot with the children and teens. And there's also another agency in town known as Lillooet Farm in which actually it helps um, people develop and create um, gardening plots in schoolyards as well as local parks and things like that. So uh, that's uh, another agency that we do a lot of uh, kind of like uh, assisted programming or, or kind of um, a joint programming with. Thank you, Walter. Uh, I'll jump in here because there's two questions sort of about the same subject and um, Melanie, I, don't, I think Walter, you just, just touched on a little bit, but I don't know if Melanie, if you do it um, too as well, but we're just talking about germination testing on donated seeds. So Nick had a similar question and there's another question down in the chat there as well. So um, see if I can just scroll back up to, to Nick's here, but um, oh, sorry, just lost it. Um, yeah, so how are you ensuring seed quality when receiving seed donations? So are you looking for germination rates, prevent cross-pollinations, et cetera? Melanie, are you doing any of that at UBC? Um, UBC Farm does all of that for us. And so we get everything as is. Um, so we're really lucky because that's where we get a lot of our seeds. And so we, we sort of know that if people use them, they'll be successful that way. Um, and I think Land and Food Systems also is is doing the testing as well. Um, yeah. I don't know if on all of the the seeds, but at least the ones that they're they're using themselves. Okay, thank you. Okay. So no testing on from like public if someone's bringing back their seeds, is UBC testing that or? Um, we we do get people talking about their own success rates, but to be okay. honest, I'm not sure what we're doing with that information. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, I know. I, I think it's the folks, I think it was a lot of food um, that did come in. Um, 
I'm sorry, I don't remember the specific name of the agency off the top of my head, but I think that they might have been from SFE or UBC. There was an agency that came in uh, to just review RCs to see what was evasive. So anything that was potentially evasive was pulled from the collection, but otherwise everything else in there was generally fine. Most of the seeds, as I said, we got from West Coast seeds or from local people that have actually been growing in the community. So most of the stuff that we have is pretty good. Uh, but yeah. we do have to get it reviewed once in a while. And it wasn't until recently I thought, oh, I guess we should probably get that done. But, you know, we live and learn or whatever. But uh, I, I know what we have is actually good. It's What's viable that? and it's local and it's uh, and it's heritage. So that's what we're trying to maintain. Yeah, and we're trying to focus on native seeds right now. Yeah. That's that's our big project. We're doing a lib guide. One of our student librarians is is doing that. And so, yeah, I mean... We, we've heard good things. No one has really come back and said that the seeds didn't work for them. So that's a positive sign. <laughs> Actually, the only thing I've heard was, I was planting a tomato where I ended up with a pepper. I'm like, well, at least it's still red and kind of edible. <laughs> that's fine. Things happen. Um, so another question here. Um, so for, I think this was for Walter, but um, maybe Melanie, you can answer this too as well. But is your, is it for library members only or town residents only for your seat library? It's for everyone and it's free. So yeah, yeah. same the same with us. Um, like when we do the registration, we ask for library card numbers. So that's the way we could contact people if we have any programs, so on and so forth. We do that through the library cards. But um, otherwise, email. Uh, end of the day somebody's making the effort making it all the way in there to find that if they don't have a library card they don't have a library card just take the seeds and use them you know i mean and the you know as far as i'm concerned they don't have to be a member to use our library we decided to be really accessible yeah. and originally yeah. we were thinking should we have um, just library card access or not and we decided that because one of our big um audiences was the ubc community they don't necessarily have UBC cards. And so we decided that definitely card access wouldn't work out here for accessibility reasons. Yeah, and for us, we have actually a, quite a large transit and um, um, uh, I should, well, I mean, a community of people that actually have unstable housing. So I think that for us, uh, I mean, they're always in the community, but they might be in different places. So I just thought, you know what, if they want to take some seeds and set up somewhere, because in the local schoolyards, there's often patches as well as like some of the local um, uh, parks. If people want to actually do it, go ahead on doing it. So we want to make it as open and as accessible as possible to anybody and everybody. Thank you. A uh, question here from Pauline for you, Walter. How do you store membership information and seeds that each individual has borrowed? Okay, storing membership information. As I said, uh, we used to actually have people sign out uh, things like on a form. So they actually had to have a, a, a printed form. What we did was we decided to go onto that form stack um, thing in which we actually had electronic. So we transferred all the information from the printed forms onto the electronic. Anybody new starting will do the electronic form. And there's an easy way uh, doing it through, I believe it was like FormSack or maybe a survey monkey kind of thing. But anyways, uh, we're able to actually go into there to find out how many people have actually been registered in this and how many over the past month. So that's how many people we find out. Now, in terms of how many um, of the seeds go out, there's two ways that we do the stats. Well, one really one official way. We have people that actually have like, there's like a little kind of like, um, uh, a form or whatever that we actually have, like a little clipboard that, you know, we have in the cabinet that says the date, how many packets you took, kind of like the type, we don't ask anything else. That's like an honor system. But when it comes down to it, if uh, we know on when we do our stats of the month, if we add a new new uh, seed packet, like if there's 150 seed packets left in the cabinet, we added in 250, tells us we have 400. When we go to the cabinet next month, we count how many are left in there. If there's 150, that tells us Probably 250 went out. That's essentially how we do our stats. Not a perfect system, but it's a good enough system to be able to gauge what, what the use suggests. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Ruth, I can answer. Oh, Walter, do you have a CD Saturday in the spring? I don't know that. 
We usually do. I don't know exactly <laughs> when it is. We usually do. I, well, you know how librarians are, you know, collection people talk to collection people, programmers talk to programmers. And once in a while we meet right by, you know, like right by the refrigerator in the staff room. And then we hear about it that way. <laughs> but I, we try to actually, we endeavor to have one twice a year. And it's usually, I believe, around February, March. And if not, um, August, September is the other one that we'll, we try to have. But just keep an eye out. Keep an eye out for that. But yeah, uh, the best person uh, to contact, if you need to know specifically, just send me an email and I'll forward it to the librarian uh, that's in charge of the CD Saturdays. I think it's CJ uh, is his name, CJ Pentland. Great. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, David, just put a link in the chat there, Ruth, too, as well. So Seeds of Diversity has a list. Um, for Folk City yeah. Folk also keeps an updated list. So we usually start getting those in probably end of this year, early uh, 2023. We'll start getting those uh, in from folks and then we'll list them up uh, on the website. Um, so I'll just keep going with the questions here for another couple minutes. Um, so maybe for both of you, um, but Melanie, how, I'll ask this for both of you, but Melanie, I'll start with you. How do you decide on which seeds to purchase? And I mean, I guess you're getting them from UBC. So perhaps maybe you don't have as much say as Walter, but, and then the number of seeds. Well, we start out by just choosing organic. So that limits things immediately. But then we also go by what people have most taken out in the past. So we're definitely choosing vegetables more often. Um, also what grows well out here um, as well. So yeah, definitely vegetables, organic, and the ones that have gone out most. So tomatoes, kale, lettuce, those are huge. Oh, and peas. We have many, many, many peas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Walter, how are you deciding on which seeds to purchase? Uh, mainly in the cabinet that we have set up. We have little tabs that actually kind of give all the different varieties that we want. So when I'm flipping through there, actually, I see what's running low. I look at our inventory, see what's running low. And then from there, that helps dictate what uh, what we order. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of a crapshoot. But as I said, the most popular things are like those tomatoes, those peas, those beans, um, kale, lettuces, and uh, a lot of the herbs, peppers. Uh, cucumbers was another one. And zucchini. Zucchini was another one that kept popping up this year. And uh, it was interesting because I uh, want to also mention was uh, during COVID, we were one of the few libraries that actually opened for takeaway access. And um, it was surprising because during COVID, um, I always found, okay, I have to say this actually on behalf of librarians, collection librarians, uh, at the best of times, collections are like the poor cousin Mildred of all library services. But during times like COVID, people look for collections, bathroom, computers, and extras, you know? Um, so we introduced a bunch of collections like puzzles and games and then a whole bunch of other things like that. Our seeds were something that was also being asked for because people couldn't access a lot of seeds through different places. So I found that very interesting. And what people were asking for was uh, food items. I, I mean, ornamentals are lovely, but uh, food items, I think that people, uh, mind you, I think also people, that was a good time for everyone to rediscover things. Like, I mean, like how many of us actually learned how to make sourdough bread or learned how to do canning at that time? I think like, you know, seeding and and growing kind of vegetables and kind of uh, things at home had a resurgence and it's kind of stuck, which mm. has been cool, kind of cool. Yeah, UBC yeah. was closed over the pandemic. Yeah. So there was no access at all to our seeds, but we have a system called Ask Away, which is a virtual chat system, which was open during the pandemic. And people would actually go on Ask Away asking when they could get seeds from, from campus. So that, that was really heartening that there were enough people using it that they really missed having access. So that was good. Thank you both. And Walter, just a quick question, because I know Melanie's yours is, is folks can just pick how many seeds and they're putting it in themselves into those little plastic bags that you showed us. Yes. Walter, yeah. Walter, you're pre-packaging them. So how many seeds are you putting in per envelope? Uh, it depends upon the <laughs> size of the seed as well as what we might think is viable. I always like having a dozen of anything or everything, if not more, depending upon how much we have in stock. If there's lots in stock, but lots of seeds in, if not, not. Um, I know I had a, a volunteer that was literally trying to put one seed into each envelope. <laughs> <laughs> which I was like, no, just put a lot of seeds in there if it's available. So and, and we just kind of like do it by, you know, just by view of what we think would work. I I added to the, to respond to that question as well, um, just for people to consider into the future. The goal, of course, is to grow seeds and return them to the library. And ideally you do that well. So 
different varieties require different population sizes to do that well. So for example, corn, you need a good 100 plants. And so if you're wanting your uh, the seed library users to actually return seeds, you have to give them enough genetics to do that. Tomatoes, lettuce, and that can be very small population sizes. Um, but definitely one is not enough. You're going to we'll end up with very inbred plants in the future. Um, so just, just thinking about doing a bit of research into how many seeds to put in an envelope based on the actual variety might be a good thing to, to do going forward. Yeah, thanks, David. And Nick had a comment there too as well, and another comment um, just regarding like best practices. So you kind of just touched on it there regarding isolation distances, uh, when to harvest, Proceed. So just asking, I think both were sort of um, asking if you provided any of those resources or limits to pesticide use, gardening methods um, for folks when they're looking to return seeds. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just aware that we're, we're at time. Um, we're happy to go over a little bit. It looks like mm -hmm. there's some interest to ask some more questions. If you do feel like you need to leave, feel free to leave. Um, but I am going to plop a survey in the chat and I would love people to fill it out. These are really helpful for us. So we're just asking people who attend these sessions to give us some feedback. Um, that would be great. And then we can we can continue for a little bit more. Yeah, we'll just go another few minutes, I think, here. Okay. I noticed there's a few other questions here. I might be able to quickly answer a couple of them. Um, one of them was, do you curate events for seeds for ethnic communities, asking them for city rich and dias uh, diaspora migrants from Africa and Asia. Um, we're not actually at the point where we could probably do that. If anything, we try to maintain or support local indigenous um, communities for the types of seeds or the types of uh, items that they may be interested in developing. Uh, and that is definitely a more of a partnership that, um, thing that we're trying to do. So that was that's actually a very good question. I would say in general, nay, but uh, for Indigenous, we try. We try. Um, another one, do you catalog seed collection with the general library collections? Very good question. Now, initially, when I actually learned about the seed, uh, the seed and when I was actually at PNLA, the Pacific Northwest Library Association, I heard about this from the folks at Missoula Public Library, which is, I guess, in Idaho. I'm not sure if I remember. Anyway, Missoula. Um, and them, uh, they were a very rural community. And for, for them, I would say a good part of the collection was their seed library collection. They cataloged anything and everything. Like they even actually barcoded the different like envelopes, you know, for, you know, taking out. So I, for them, it was very much an inventory kind of thing. We don't have the, we don't have the capacity ourselves to do something like cataloging them specifically. So it's, as I said, it's kind of, almost like a cameo collection, which is available. We try to actually make sure that it uh, has a good amount of kind of like, you know, depth and coverage and scope for the different types of varieties, but we don't catalog it per se. We don't, I mean, it would be lovely if we could, but that would be a full-time job for somebody just right there. And I, that I would not be able to support um, in as a public library per se. Um, other things, um, track return rate. No, we don't. Um, sometimes I find when it comes to collections, especially with donations, it's intuition. You just have a good feel about what comes back and how much comes back. And we don't, um, as I said, it ebbs and it flows. Sometimes there's only like you know, about three or four different types of seeds, which are donated one month. And then the next month, somebody will actually have like a huge box of seeds that they've had in the garage forever that we kind of have to vet through. So, um, we're kind of lucky. We're finding it's kind of steady with the amount that we kind of get. I would say a good shoebox worth of seed donations every month is what we're getting from people. And of course, you know, people give us more than what we need for different varieties. Uh, I can't think. Okay, sorry, Missoula is in Montana. I should know that. <laughs> okay. Anyways, lovely place. Um, I can't think of any other questions. I'm not sure, Melanie, if you have any that you think. Yeah, I can speak to some of these here. So um, we don't track the return rate, but we're planning to do that. So another thing I should mention is we're not allowed to use volunteers here. We have to use paid staff. So if we were able to use volunteers, we would have more manpower to do a lot of these things. And so we're a little bit constrained, but that is one thing we're definitely planning to do in the future. And in terms of the ethnic communities question, um, we will be partnering with the Huaywa Library, which is the indigenous library on campus. And so we're 
we're planning to do events um, with them um, in terms of indigenous growing and, you know, et cetera. So, but in terms of other communities, not yet. We also have an Asian library on campus. And so we're also thinking of doing a joint event with them. We just need to figure out what exactly we want to, to do with that. But, but all of those things are in the works. Wonderful, thank you. Actually, well, and, follow, um, and follow up to what uh, Melanie just mentioned. Um, it's funny, I, did, I haven't even thought about this. Melanie, this is an opportunity across BC create actually kind of like an indigenous based or indigenous community based kind of seed collection or like a seed kind of like stock of some sort. Because a lot um, a lot of the local indigenous communities, of course, use different types of plants, um, herbs, yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, for different types of things, not only for food growing, but for ceremonial things. Like this yes. is um, this is like ethnobotany at its best, and there's been no initiative. Just a good idea because oh, I mean, this is a good yeah, way we've to already thought of and, that. Wow, that would be a real feather in the librarian's hat now, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> but we also have a lot of indigenous um, users that have yes. mentioned that to us, so there is a lot of interest. There's interest, and it's yeah. the type of thing that I can't see just being done in one community. It's almost like something that should stretch across different boundaries and borders and groups. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, to be continued. <laughs> Watch the space. <laughs> yes, discussion for another, our next uh, event. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up because we're almost to 1240. So thank you again, Melanie and Walter. It was wonderful to have you both. And thanks again, a huge thank you to both of you and Melanie. Thank you so much for stepping in last minute too as well. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah. Okay, and the, everyone just check out the resources uh, are in the chat and the surveys in the chat too as well. And uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow for our next two sessions. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.